Thank you so much. It's great to it's great to be here. It's great to meet everyone. Uh, everyone can see my screen, all right. So I'm Leandra. Uh, like Dave said, I'm here with VidCode, and this presentation is going to be focused on how to integrate programming, computer programming, into all subject areas with a focus on science. Um, really quick, thank you so much for putting on this conference. Uh, thank you to the other speakers, uh, and thank you to all the teachers for being here. Um, I know you're all really busy right now, so. It's, it's so great that you've taken the time to come be here with us. The agenda of the presentation, really quick. Uh, we're going to focus on really briefly on why we would want any kind of cross-curricular computer science activities. We're going to go through examples that other students have made and teachers have made over the years and sort of the different categories that those examples fall into. We are going to go into some specific remote class tips, so how to integrate programming in a remote uh, classroom environment. And at the end, we're going to code a project together in the VidCode sandbox that does uh, that you might be able to use in a cross-curricular setting. I'm going to move this presenter box out of the way. So my name is Leandra. I am the co-founder and chief product officer at VidCode. VidCode is a coding platform and computer science curriculum. We have a computer science pathway and coding sandbox for third through 12th grade. We teach JavaScript and we were recently rated number one as far as CSTA alignment by the Education Alliance of Finland. This is our coding sandbox. We're going to be spending more time in here together soon. But it's a really great place once students are ready to move beyond Scratch and other block-based programming, but aren't necessarily ready to just be dropped into an open code editor yet. We have these blocks that as you drag them into the code editor, turn into real JavaScript code that students can then edit and start to make these projects here. Um, somebody asked if VidCode is free. Um, I'll probably be answering some throughout as well. Uh, I get very distracted by that chat pop up. Um, VidCode is free until the, usually we have um, like three units free out of uh, like 15 different units. Right now everything is free. If you just go to vidcode.com and sign up, um, there's a form to fill out. It says apply now, but everybody gets free access uh, who fills out the form. Um, and it's free either until the end of the year or if schools reopen later than that, until schools reopen. Uh, this coding sandbox area is always free. Um, it's the curriculum that schools um, sometimes do for, not right now. Students make these really visual projects on the canvas here on the right um, that they can publish and share. Um, and we also have a media gallery where students can upload their own files, their own graphics, their own music, or record their own photos and videos from their webcam. That makes it a really easy place to use cross-curricular projects because it's so easy to like take in those other um, other media relating to other subjects and code projects using them. One of the reasons that we care so much about integrating programming um, and computer science into other subject areas is because it's a way to overcome inequity in computer science. A lot more students are reached. Um, when programming is integrated into existing subject areas. And it gives students a chance to connect programming, something maybe they haven't thought about, with a subject they already like and already connect with. We're going to be touching on all of these pieces of computational thinking in our examples today. Um, the computational thinking is the transferable part of computer science. So it's the part that we really care about, even for the students who aren't going to go on to be programmers or aren't interested in going on to be programmers, they're still able to take the skills like decomposition, generalization, abstraction, pattern recognition, and algorithm design, and apply them to other subjects and other things that they're doing uh, in school or outside of school. And like I said, the projects that we covered today are going to show examples of all of these different types of computational thinking. When students connect programming to their favorite subject areas, um, it helps increase student engagement in those programming activities. 
and it helps increase the number of non-traditional students, students who haven't thought about themselves as programmers, students who don't have a parent in tech. Um, it helps reach those students and helps them identify as programmers. So I just want to dive into some of the projects that students have made. I've broken these up into three categories. They all have different benefits and different, um, different purposes, um, and they're good for students who are at different places in kind of their programming learning journey. The first is that it's really easy on VidCode to code a project to illustrate a point. So to make a project that replaces a PowerPoint presentation or augments a research paper or a science fair or a poster session um, and combine student research with a programming activity. So that's actually the project that we're going to be coding together. To show you some examples of that, this one's really cute. I'll show you this one first and then kind of talk about it. So that's an example of this first type of programming activity where students illustrate a point. So in this case, the programming part of the activity isn't necessarily tied to the research that they're doing. Um, here, they're creating variables and customizing them, um, placing them on the canvas, adding different effects. Um, and those can help illustrate the point that they're making, but they're not exactly tied to the research. But it does give students a chance to get exposed to programming while um, uh, integrating it with some of their uh, the research that they had to do for science class. The projects that illustrate a point, um, some of the benefits are that they're really easy to get started. You could tell with that project there wasn't a lot of code there. Um, the next one's going to have even less. So it's this very gentle introduction to coding that isn't scary. Um, Sometimes their code will break, but it won't be anything they can't overcome pretty easily. Um, and it connects uh, computer science to your science class without needing to find extra time in class. So the time that they would take making a PowerPoint presentation or a poster, they spend coding instead. So you don't have to find that extra time to teach them uh, a separate coding activity. Here's another really good one. So same thing, a student uploaded all these different photos of a frog life cycle at different points and coded them together in this array to make this life cycle project. This is similar to what we're going to be making together at the end. Uh, we're going to be making a stop motion as well or a slideshow. The second type of cross-curricular programming that I like to go over is when a concept is actually integrated into the project. Let me show you what I mean by that. So in this case, a student created this animation by like using a sine wave in their code to make this animation that their garbage is on, to make this really nice sine wave. And to do this, they had to not only understand what a sine wave is, they had to have enough of an understanding um, to actually use it in their code to create an animation. So it's a way to model their understanding of that math concept and make something really cool.
The third way, um, and this is probably the most time intensive way, um, you can see even with this project, I'll open it again really quick. There's a lot more code that we're dealing with uh, than the previous projects. So this is going to be more time intensive. It's going to be a bit more, you're not going to be able to integrate it in class as seamlessly. It's going to take a bit more effort. And that's true for modeling student research as well. Um, so there's all these ways to actually model what students are learning in their code. The first and maybe like most straightforward way is just the math problem. So in this, students programmed this graph just to show the result of this math problem. I can change it. And as the student who built this, I have a much greater understanding of this math problem and graphing it than I did before. This can also be true in a more complicated way. Um, in this case, a student copied the instructions for the Soluit wall drawing 289, if anyone's familiar, um, and made this generative piece. But to do it, they had to sit down and actually follow these instructions. So making 24 lines from the center, 12 lines from the midpoint, 12 lines from the corner, and use these different math problems to actually model this. So this is a cool one because it kind of combines math, art, and programming in this really cool way. Uh, two more examples of the modeling one. The first is this eclipse simulation. So this one's cool because it actually tracks me as a user, my mouse. Um, and as I get further away, things get later. And as I get closer, things get darker. So it's able to take real life phenomenon and simulate it in this pretty simple coding project. This is the last one. This is my phases of matter simulation. So in an example like this, students could actually take the research that they're doing and apply it to this model. Um, there's no numbers on here, but there's no reason that there couldn't be. There we go, now I have ice. And so me as the user or the teacher, I'm able to actually explore student data, changing temperature and pressure using the simulation they created. Before I um, dive into us like coding a project together, I wanted to go over some remote class tips. We've been working with virtual schools for a long time and uh, having our own virtual club that we started a couple of months ago. Um, so some of the things that we've learned, especially when teaching students how to code for the first time, has been to give them multiple ways to learn. Um, I found that remote learning is a really great opportunity to actually um, give students who do learn different ways, different methods. Um, we have YouTube videos that they can watch that actually animate concepts. We meet and I code through different tutorials and talk about different programming concepts. Um, and we also send them things that they can read on their own or they can go through tutorials on their own. So based on how those students actually learn, there's so many different ways for them to like sit down and learn remotely on their own. The other thing that we've learned has just been to give them goals and milestones to keep them motivated. VidCode has certificates built into our site um, but there's all kinds of ways that you can um, keep them motivated when they've made a certain amount of projects, um, learned certain concepts, done a certain amount well on quizzes, sort of anything. It's also been super important for students to have a place to share and comment on and see each other's work. It's so different when they don't feel like they're making projects in isolation. 
Um, the favorite students' favorite part of Coding Club is when they get to share their projects at the end. We have like a live chat and students post their projects and I talk about them. Um, I say something constructive, I say something really nice, we celebrate their projects. Um, and it's a great opportunity um, to do that. Yeah, the last prompt here is celebrate student work. We have a showcase. It doesn't have any student names on it, um, but every teacher on VidCode has a showcase where they can add student work, share it with teachers, share it with parents, um, share it with uh, the students themselves so they can see each other's projects. Um, and it's a really just great place to show them that um, their work is meaningful and is seen by others. It can also be really great, and this is a good um, sort of tip that we've learned both for remote classes and in, in person as well, um, is to give prompts, but leave projects open for student creativity. So I did a cross-curricular project with teachers recently, um, and my prompt was, they were all, it was New York, so everyone's learning about student data privacy right now. Um, and so I had them all code a meme with a data privacy tip, I think it was. So something like that, something like a prompt like that, gives students something more specific to plan and create, other than like something that's open-ended, as code a meme, but it still leaves projects open for their creativity. Within, um, within that prompt, within student data privacy, things were all over the map. Um, there were, uh, really funny phishing projects. There were really funny email projects. Um, there were projects about teachers leaving their computers open. Um, so anything like that where you can make it feel like it's not just like this empty sandbox, um, giving them some kind of yeah focus or prompt. So with that, we can go and actually go into VidCode and code a project together. We're going to be using it as a class, as this imaginary class, um, the CIS research from NSIDC. Just to show you VidCode really quick, um, I did mention earlier somebody asked in the Q&A, um, we are free to access it you'll just go to vidcode.com. There's a big create account button that isn't there because I'm signed in, um, but just sign up there. Um, this button says apply now, there's a form to fill out. Uh, it says apply, but every single person who fills it out gets access. Um, so you can just apply there and have access to vidcode for the rest of the year. Oh, someone says they're already subscribed. Thank you. You're gonna be dropped into this dashboard. That's the My Classes dashboard. Um, if you press Add Students or Class Dashboard, this big blue button, it's going to drop you into the teacher view. That's where you're going to get things like your lesson plans, um, your ability to see student work. Um, we don't expect teachers who are bringing this into their class to know how to code themselves. Um, that's what the lesson plans are for. There's answer keys, um, slides, videos, everything you would need to um, introduce this class. Start coding brings me into the student side, so the actual coding course that students are going to see. Some really good cross-curricular activities. I recommend every student starts with Creative Filter because it's this really gentle introduction to programming, to vid code, um, to leaving like a block-based coding environment. But after that, um, Make a Meme can be really good for a cross-curricular setting. Um, it's really easy to give prompts like the one that I mentioned. Uh, and then starter projects is the other place to go um, for those that one type of programming activity that illustrate a point one. Um, starter projects is a really great place. So anything in slideshow um, is good. Um, code the news can be good, especially to code something about a current event. Um, and plastic pollution PSA. Um, this one's about plastic pollution, but students can kind of make any PSA they want um, based on their own research and their own data. Um, so this is a really good one as well. To do the actual research one, it's a bit hard to fit it into just a one-off class just because they're a bit more complicated. Um, but if you go down to unit nine, 
um, this is where students start getting into actually like making their own software. Um, and yeah, nine and up, um, you're going to start getting into like modeling your own data. Um, I know that's kind of far. Um, you don't have to go through every single tutorial to get there, especially if you're a high school group. Um, but it is good to do one or two tutorials from each one to sort of get you ready and get you in a place to start making your own software to model research that your students are doing. I um, am not going to do an example of that. I'm just going to go into slideshow here. So this is the VidCode coding sandbox that you saw before, except this one has a tutorial in it. So they're all going to be sort of the same. I'm going to have instructions on the left here, my code editor in the middle, my final project here on the right, and then my media gallery here where I can uh, upload my own photos and videos. For this project, I'm going to research Uh, a live graph of CA from NSIDC. Um, I'm going to interpret the graph and draw conclusions about it. Uh, I'm going to produce and code a project about the conclusions. Um, I'll add filters to make this video stand out and get my message across. For younger students especially, this can be a really great opportunity to um, talk about how to do research, um, like what sites are trustworthy, um, that sort of thing. Uh, for older students, um, I mean, they're usually a bit better at it. Uh, so here, um, I have this whole site full of data. I'm going to go down to satellite observations of Arctic change. And this is going to give me all of these different topics that I can look at, vegetation, snow cover, sea ice. Let's jump into sea ice. And with this graph, I can slide through and see over time Arctic sea ice anomalies. So based on this picture and this graph, um, I can come to the conclusion that uh, it looks like sea ice in the Arctic has decreased from 1985 to 2015. And so based on that, um, that's my conclusion that I've drawn. Now I have to, through my coding project, show the evidence that brought me to that conclusion. So the first thing I'm going to do is upload some of the um, pictures from that website. Every tutorial in VidCode is going to be really good at walking me through different concepts. Um, you'll see this when you make accounts, but the courses are broken up into tutorials, challenges, quizzes, and puzzles. Um, and big final projects. Tutorials are really handholdy and walk students through new projects and different concepts. Um, challenges are going to be more open-ended. Um, puzzles are going to give students broken code or something to kind of figure out and solve. Um, and big final projects put them in a sandbox um, where they plan and create a bigger project. This is an example of a tutorial. Um, so I'm going to click next here. Um, it's going to prompt me to upload my pictures. I already have. And so now I can select these. I'm going to start with 1985, drag them into my video. And they're going to automatically populate into this array. So this is what I was talking about before, how this can be um, a really gentle way to get students off of something like uh, um, like Scratch, like something block-based, uh, because at, in the beginning, in the more introductory tutorials, it's a lot of just dragging things in, seeing code populate, and letting me edit it. 
There are tutorials that walk me through my code. Um, introduce things like arrays uh, and whatever other topics this tutorial goes over. It gives me tips into how to organize my code. And so we have quizzes at the end of units, um, and then we also have them sort of throughout the tutorial to get students to slow down. Cool, and then I'm gonna write my own line of code to set my frames to go into a certain point. Um, I'm almost out of time here, uh, but if I wanted to add different things, there's always the reference. Um, so different tutorials are gonna have different effects. Um, but whenever students want to revisit something that they've learned before or um, try and explore something new, they can always dive into the reference. Um, advanced students usually find this right away. And I can find something like text and write my conclusion here. Yeah, let's see some other text. <laughs> And there's also going to be things like Drawing shapes. Cool. Um, I know it should be set to zero zero by default. Someone said I need an X and Y. Um, No, it shouldn't matter. Oh, interesting. So usually my um, my text will start right at zero zero. Um, for some reason, my coordinates were all the way up here. Um, so I can add things like size, make this a lot bigger. Cool. Um, one of the prompts here was to um, apply filters to make this video stand out and get my message across. Um, I have to make a decision here. Uh, a filter might take away um, the ability to like see the colors. I don't want to get in the way of the data, um, but I could add something, maybe like a vignette. And I could maybe like increase it over time to show the magnitude of the situation or something like that. Here's the example that I had put together before. Um, so this is something that your students could do as well, um, since they're gonna have more time, uh, but make something like a key that actually shows the time passing um, I added a blur effect, so you can kind of see how one picture goes to the other. Um, and there's also two graphs here, one that represents ice and one that represents vegetation, um, and shows some correlation there uh, that could be played around with as well. And I think that is our half hour. Um, 
I'm here, Leandra. Hey. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. You know, you're another expert who's been <laughs> dealing with the chat at the same time, which is great. Um, but I do have some questions for you that I didn't see. There might be some that pop up too. They've, they've been coming up. Um, how are how are schools like? What's an example of, of how schools are weaving computer science into their curriculum? Can you give an example or two? Yeah, um, so there's all kinds of really great examples. Uh, it a lot of times, unfortunately, ends up on the teacher. Um, so we see a lot of really great examples, teacher by teacher, versus like big district-led initiatives. Um, the one top of mind was a history class where they would be coding different projects based on current events. And that would be anything from memes to animations uh, to newscasts. Um, and they would take some kind of news article, uh, draw a conclusion about it, and make a project about it. Um, or sometimes they would even draw a conclusion, sometimes they would just comment on it. Um, let's see. Another really good example that I always think of was a class in the UK. They had an art class and an English class work together. And they coded different postcards based on where the main character of the book they were reading had gone. Um, and the art class came in and made the postcards like representative of the time period um, and the places as well. Uh, so that was a very cool project. That's pretty cool. If you think of like art, you don't think of computer science, but you can actually weave it in there. Yeah, 100%. We've had art classes um, that use the VitCode curriculum. Uh, and it's a great opportunity because they're not as focused on, like they're not worried about test scores. Um, and so it gives them the opportunity for students to be a bit more creative and spend a bit more time on their projects uh, and has had some really cool results. That's interesting. I didn't think it, you know, because you don't think of it as a tough class art, but if you add that component to it, then you put a, maybe a little extra extra effort is required, but then it's still a kind of a relaxed class. That's a, that's a nice way to do it. Yeah, and it gives students, like especially in an art class, exposure to, to programming and these kind of skills, especially if you do go in an art or design direction, you like, there's a lot more possible with what you can do if you have some experience programming. Makes a lot of sense. I have a question for you that I, I thought of, you know, we should probably do the same. I know you, VidCode has been around a while and you guys have been doing this a while. Have you fo followed any of your students who've gone on to maybe computer science majors or, or careers in computer science? Some. Um, the easiest one to think of is interns that we've had, just because the most involved students often become interns. We have a lot of high school interns, not a lot, but we have like a handful every summer. Uh, one um, was going to be a veterinarian, like is still going to be a veterinarian, but she has conceded to minor in computer science. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, who else? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a bunch of kids who have gone on um, and either like minored in computer science um, or interned with us and then gone on to get other like really, really cool tech jobs. Um, so it's been across the board. That's that's great. We've had some interns who've gone on to, well, so somebody wants to intern for a, a technology company is probably wants to do a technical degree later or something. Yeah, but yeah. No, it's definitely uh, biased data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely biased. So that's an interesting project though to think of. You know, if you could track a student, and I mean, that would feel really good for every for the teachers, for for you, for everyone. That is a student you know, got interested in science or, or computer science or technology from, from your products. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, especially now that we're doing more hands-on, like we started remote coding clubs um, where we are a bit more hands-on and students are actually meeting with like some of our curriculum people. Um, and so I think it'll be even easier to track there because we won't be dependent on kind of teachers reporting back to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. Leandra, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And that was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone.